Good morning. It's great to have you here at Lawson Road one more time on a Sunday morning for our worship service uh, online. And I hope your week has been a good one and uh, the God you felt, God's presence with you throughout the week. Today marks a real milestone for us. Uh, today, we hope, if all goes well, uh, today will be our last online or pre-recorded worship service. Uh, they'll still be online next next uh, week. Our plan is that we will stream the service that takes place inside at 9.30 in the morning. And, uh, you know, it'll take us a little while, I'm sure, to get up to speed and get everything working. Right now we're still having some audio issues and uh, I could have egg on my face because I could be back here pre-recording next Sunday. But hopefully we get those audio issues uh, sorted out and uh, we can all exp have the same uh, worship experience next week. Uh, so who would have believed that two and a half years ago, it, it almost is exactly two and a half years ago, we would have been doing this um, for, for this amount of time and for this long. Yeah, for this long. Uh, we, we had no idea when this started and yet uh, we believe that God has been good to us in that time. There have been a lot of changes, there have been a lot of heartaches to be sure, there have been a lot of worries, uh, a lot of illness and not all of it COVID. Um, life has continued, it's all the usual crises and have, have continued to, to crop up and yet uh, here we are and we believe that God has been good to us in that time and so we're going to uh, worship today we're going to go inside and uh, and worship uh, but a as we do or before we do please grab your communion supplies as we'll have the Lord's Supper a little later grab your Bible grab your coffee if you need to do that or tea or cup of cold water whatever it is that uh, that you prefer and uh, we will uh, head on in before we do oh don't forget to give us a thumbs up and uh, we will uh, appreciate that. It lets other people know that we're here. Uh, you can also subscribe if you haven't already done so to this channel and you'll get notified when there are, are updates. I will say that uh, you should still be able to um, watch online. It's only going to be on YouTube. There won't be Facebook, at least not at first. We may get that back. Uh, but if you go to our Facebook, our YouTube page, you should still find a link that will say live streaming or um, live video, something like that. Uh, hopefully, I will figure out the logistics. Hopefully, I'll still send you a, a link if you're on our email list. And uh, so look for us at 9.30 next Sunday. If you're subscribed, you will get a notification. And so that'll make it easier. Look for that subscribe button on your screen. We're going to uh, uh, play a song that is uh, very cheerful, and uh, I hope that, that you enjoy it. And it's, if you want to sing along, tap your foot, that's great. Go for it. And we will worship God together in just a moment. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise. Oh, 
Good morning, and welcome to the Lawson Road Church of Christ online worship service. We're glad to have you here this morning. I have a couple of announcements this morning. The first announcement being, for the month of August, on Wednesday evening, our Bible classes will be held jointly with our sister congregation, North Greece Road. We'll be alternating locations uh, between where the Bible study will be held. And we ask that if you're able to make it, that you come and show your support. Beginning on the first Wednesday, will be held at our location, Lawson Road. Again, these Bible studies will be uh, streamed, so if you're not able to make it, you'll be able to see them, uh, fill your streaming uh, services. Second um, announcement for today, August 21st, that is Worship in the Park for us, August 21st. Remember, um, we ask that when you come for Worship in the Park to bring um, a chair for yourself. Uh, since it will be outside in the park, that you we, you bring a, a chair for yourself. I saw the announcements that I have for this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time that we have to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're grateful for you waking us up this morning, breathing another day of life into our, our bodies. We're grateful that you are so mindful of us. At this time, Heavenly Father, as we go into this worship service, I hope and pray that the things that we say and do will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And I also pray that there will be something said here today that will make everyone want to draw closer to you. I ask this prayer in your Son and our Savior, Jesus to Christ's name. Amen. Like a river flowing down to the sea Like a rushing wind you blow into me Like the falling of the snow Like the blood that makes me whole Is the love of God that flows into me like a river you come flooding through the desert of my heart and like the wind you come rushing blowing life through every part and like the snow you're falling on me with the blood of your own like the sun, you come shining, making darkness run. Like a river flowing down to the sea, like a rushing wind you blow into me. Like the blood that makes me whole Is the love of God that flows into me Like a river you come pouring out Your love upon the field And like the wind you bring Harvest down to take your yield and like the snow you come to winter, touching hearts and making warmth. And like the sun, you raise a mighty light to calm the storm. Like a river flowing down to the sea. Like a rushing wind you blow into me Like the falling of the snow Like the blood that makes me whole Is the love of God that flows into me
Good morning, Lost and Road. Today I'll be reading from Psalm 49, verses 1 through 12. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The meditation of my heart will give you understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With a harp, I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches, no one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tomb will remain their house forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, all about you, I'm coming back, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. Ooh, yeah, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus.
Today we're continuing our sermon series, considering what faith looks like in the life of some of the um, people, prominent people in Scripture. But I want to begin in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, we find the uh, account of the baptism of Jesus. And if you or I were writing the story of Jesus' life, he would probably begin his ministry with being baptized. And then he would go and probably select his disciples immediately. And then he would get started in ministry, doing some small things, and then gradually build up to a big thing, a problem that he needs to solve. And, uh, and then might settle down again and would get to the cross and the, the grave. But that's not what happens. Jesus was baptized. And when he's baptized, um, two things happen. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, we're told. And a voice comes from heaven as God the Father affirms who he is and his love uh, for him. And so then in chapter 4, verse 1, the Holy Spirit immediately leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. Jesus isn't given time to mature his faith. He's not uh, given an opportunity to practice his ministry, uh, to get the, the use of it. He's not even given uh, the, the opportunity to recruit his disciples, to establish a support system for himself. He's out of the waters of baptism and straight into the fire of the wilderness. So let's take a moment to read what happens there in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 2. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this. I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. I don't want to focus today on the details of Jesus' temptation. Rather, I want to look at his response. Jesus, when tempted by the devil, responds by quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, then Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, and finally Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. And a lot of people have speculated that during his 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, that Jesus may well have spent time meditating on the story of Israel in the wilderness. After all, he was reenacting their journey. He had passed through the water, or well, they both passed through the water, whether it be the Red Sea or baptism, and then into the wilderness. Uh, Israel had all kinds of temptations in the wilderness, and routinely they gave in. They, they got angry with God, they gave up on God, and they turned and they wanted to go back to, to Egypt. Whereas Jesus is kind of redeeming that in a sense, and, and he, as he is tempted... Not after 40 years, but after 40 days, as he is tempted, he, he is able to um, actually use the scriptures, use the stories from the very uh, Exodus experience and, uh, and use those in refuting Satan and uh, withstanding those temptations. In a sense, Jesus was alone in the wilderness, but in another sense, he was led there by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't just 
drop him off and uh, you know walk away the Holy Spirit was still with him he also had this affirmation of God ringing in his ears you are my son um, whom I love with him I am well pleased and and so he may have had cause to question that but still he'd had that experience of hearing those words said to him uh, to affirm that his decision to to be baptized to begin this ministry was the right decision to make and, and then he had scriptures as we've just seen uh, scriptures that he'd learned perhaps memorized that he'd been meditating on and they also encouraged and um, gave him strength when he was confronted by satan we could also mention his upbringing, his community of faith, his, his town, uh, the synagogue and other people that spoke into his life, his parents and their faith passed on to him. And so all of these experiences, uh, all of these voices are with him in that time in the wilderness. Now, when we turn to the book of Exodus, we find there the person that we'll be studying over the next few weeks. But his experience is very different. Several centuries after the life of Joseph, the descendants of Jacob are still living in Egypt. And while they could, I suppose, have returned to Canaan after the famine, uh, remember it was a famine that brought them down to Egypt, after the famine they could have gone back. Uh, but they didn't, for whatever reason, we're not told. They stayed there in Egypt. Perhaps because the Pharaoh was sympathetic to them, or because Joseph was second in command, which is you know, that gives you a lot of privilege. Or uh, maybe it was because they'd been given land that they could settle in, whereas they didn't actually own any land back in Canaan. Life, generally speaking, was good for them. Now, then there was a regime change. Eventually, a new pharaoh came to power and he represented a new dynasty. And, and so there was a, a change of the... You know, every so often there would be a, a new lineage of pharaohs, a, a new family, a new group of people represented on the throne. And that's what apparently had happened. And so this new pharaoh representing a new people group had come to power and he was, uh, he'd probably won a war against the, the old uh, dynasty that Joseph had served. And so as an outsider, he didn't know the story of Joseph. He didn't understand who the presence of the Hebrews in Egypt. And he recognized they weren't Egyptian and he regarded them as a threat to the throne. And so he enslaved them. We see that um, explanation given in Exodus chapter 1. I'm just going to read uh, verses 8 through 11 here. Exodus 1. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. So the Hebrews are no longer privileged people, you know, free to tend their crops in Goshen. They are now being put to work building cities for Pharaoh. Um, as if this wasn't enough, though, after a while, as their population continued to grow, uh, in his paranoia, Pharaoh uh, told the Egyptian midwives to kill the uh, children who were male children who were born. You know, throw them into the Nile was what he told them. They didn't. And so the population kept growing. And uh, so then Pharaoh gave this order at the end of chapter one. Pharaoh gave the order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So he is seeking to weaken the, the Hebrew people in a dramatic way. And these are the circumstances into which Moses is born. 
When Moses is born, he is hidden by his parents for three months. And then his mother and sister come up with a scheme uh, to have him adopted by a princess who regularly bathes in the river. When he was about three, after three months, he was placed in a basket and in the river, not just floated out into the middle of the river, but no doubt placed amongst the reeds and along the edge near where she, uh, the, this Pharaoh's daughter was known to, to bathe regularly. And when she discovers the, the baby in the basket, she recognizes it as a Hebrew baby. And Moses' sister just happens to be nearby and happens to know a woman who would be able to nurse that baby for the princess. The princess, I guess, plays along with it and um, it says, sure. And so Moses' sister runs home, gets her mother and brings, brings her back so that she can be the nurse for her own child. However, after a few, uh, probably years, until Moses is weaned, he stays there with his family, but then is taken to the palace. That's where he's given the name Moses and uh, an Egyptian name, and then is raised as an Egyptian in the palace. So he would have gone to the Egyptian royal school. He would have been taken to the Egyptian royal temple for the festivals, the feasts and religious services. You see, Moses was separated from his family, separated from his ethnic group during these formative years of his life. To all appearances, Moses was an Egyptian. Then, one day while watching Hebrew slaves uh, working out in the, in the sun, building these cities, he sees an Egyptian beating one of the one of the Hebrews and he intervenes, but he does so so violently that he kills the Egyptian. I guess he buries the body, hides the body and hopes, thinks that he hasn't been seen, but he discovers the next day that he was seen and he, he runs for it. He heads out into the wilderness uh, to a country named Midian. We usually think of Moses as a great leader of faith. And when we look at his life as a whole, Mo there's no doubt that Moses is a great leader of faith. But here at the start of his life, we don't find any mention of Yahweh. Moses really seems to be living life by his own rules. He kills a man and then runs for his life. There's no prayer. There's no discernment process about the best way to free his people from the oppression that they're experiencing. He acts impulsively. And when he reaches the wilderness, he, he there you know, meets a family, meets some people, ends up marrying the daughter of the priest of Midian. We don't know if this priest was aware of Yahweh. More likely than not, he wasn't. The most likely thing is that he was the priest that worshipped the local idols of the Midianites. When God eventually reveals himself to Moses in chapter 3, he has to introduce himself. Moses uh, he says in verse 5 of chapter 3, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses knew enough about his Hebrew culture to recognize those names, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But he didn't know God. He, he seems to have had very little knowledge of, of God. Now, sure, he, he heard that you know, God introduced himself, he falls on his face, but I don't know if he's doing that so much out of respect for God as much as it is the, um, 
bush is burning, but the leaves are not being consumed by the flames. And uh, there's a voice talking out of the fire, like probably any of us would fall on our faces also in those circumstances. And then in verse 13, Moses is concerned about what he's going to tell uh, the Israelites when he goes back to Egypt, because God says, I want you to go back to Egypt and bring my people out. Moses says, I don't even know your name. How am I going to, to do that? Well, who will I tell them? Sent me. Moses doesn't know that. And, and so God goes on and uh, in verse 14, gives Moses a name that he can be called. And it's the first time that he's done that. As we read the first couple of chapters of Exodus, there's no doubt that God is at work in the story. God is doing things. God is training and developing Moses. He preserved his life initially, but then develops him, trains him in the Egyptian palace, um, protects him, allows him to escape after he kills the Egyptian, and now is, is calling him for a purpose. And so God is at work. He hears Israel when they cry out, when their slavery, when their conditions become too much, and they cry out to God, he heals them. And at the end of chapter 2, we're told that God heard their groaning. He remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. He wants to do something. So God is present. But Moses has very little um, knowledge of the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew people, history, and certainly the Hebrew God. We might wonder why God chose him. Is he the most qualified or the least qualified at this point? Does he even know who God is? Compared to Jesus, Moses had no real sense of identity. Is he Egyptian? Is he Hebrew? Is he Midianite? He's been living amongst the Midianites for a long time now. He has this fuzzy sense of who his God is, uh, but he's married into the family of a Midianite priest. He really probably knows more about the Egyptian gods and more about the Midianite gods than he knows about Yahweh. Moses also has no written record of everything that God had done for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Perhaps he remembers some stories that he'd heard from his mother when he was very young, but he it certainly wasn't written down, certainly wasn't something that he could study and draw strength from. But now he's confronted with a burning bush and it's talking to him. So Jesus, when Jesus confronted the devil, he had so much more going for him. So much more um, faith, but, but not just faith, so, much more, so many more faith building experiences in his life that brought him to a point where he was prepared and equipped to confront Satan, to confront those temptations, to begin his ministry with a bang, so to speak. On the other hand, Moses probably wouldn't have done very well if thrown into Jesus' situation. Moses barely knew who God was at this point. And so um, what we see is that God um, puts us in situations that match up with where we are in our walk. He's not, God isn't comparing Moses and Jesus at this point in their lives. I want to bring these two experiences together, though, Jesus and Moses, using a teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. On this particular day, Jesus had left some of his disciples uh, to uh, by themselves and while they're hanging around um, a man walks up to them and brings his son his son is possessed by a demon and the man asks the disciples to cast out this demon 
and which is something that they've done before earlier in the book. But this time they're unable to uh, cast out the demon. Just then Jesus walks over and he casts it out. No, no problem. Then in uh, chapter 17 of Matthew, verse 19, the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So we need to consider this because Jesus says that they couldn't cast out the demon because they didn't have enough faith. But then notice how much faith he says that they need. Not very much at all. Just like enough, the amount of a mustard seed, a very small seed. And so you might say, but these are the disciples. They've been following him around all this time. Why don't they have enough faith? And I think that we're not given all the details, but it seems that they were like perhaps relying on themselves, that, that they had the ability to cast out demons rather than God working through them. Uh, there's also um, the idea here that they were struggling to get on the same page with Jesus about his trajectory, about where he was going to the cross, because they were looking for something more militaristic and, and more um, earthly kingdom rather than spiritual kingdom. And, and so it seems to me sometimes that Christians become fixated upon whether or not we have enough faith. Uh, we'll hear people say things like, uh, maybe you're, not, you're sick, you're not healed, you're not, life isn't going well because you don't have enough faith. Uh, and so Perhaps we feel like we're supposed to have so much faith that we could go and, and we could fight Goliath at the drop of a hat. That, that we could do what Noah did, you know, build an ark for decades um, if, if that's what God asked us to do. That, that sure, we've got faith like Jesus. We could go we could go one on one with, with the devil and we'd be able to you know, survive that. And, and so... I think that that expectation is unrealistic. And it's why I'm really glad that Jesus says what he does. He says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. You see, Jesus, you're thinking and when he says, oh, you didn't have enough faith to cast out that demon. That what he's going to say next is you need faith like a bowling ball to bowl over the devil. You need faith like a Mack truck to run over the devil. You need faith. Faith like a mustard seed. And if you have that, you can move mountains. Of course, he doesn't mean move a mountain, but, but he's saying you can accomplish great things. You can, um, that because faith is not about what you can do, but about what God is able to do. The success of the task Ahead of us, the success in getting through the, the obstacle and the challenge ahead of us is, has very little to do with the amount of faith that I have, but everything to do with who my faith is in. One writer compared it to looking at the moon through a window. It doesn't matter how big the window is or how small it is. What's important is that the window is facing the right direction. When it comes to our faith, the most important aspect of it is that our faith is in God, that we're looking in the right direction, that we're looking to God. And where our faith may be a big window, our faith may be a hole as small as a mustard seed, but when we're looking in the right place, we will see God. And God, that's all God needs for him to be able to accomplish great things. Moses may not have known much about Yahweh, but his eventual willingness to listen and, uh, and obey started him on a great journey of faith. 
And we're not called to confront Pharaoh or the powers of the, the world uh, every day. Maybe we're never called to, to confront those kind of powers. But we are called to listen to God, to obey God, to talk to God, to, to look in the right direction. That's what our faith does for us. Because who knows what God has in store for you and for me. Maybe you're about to start on a great journey of faith. And it begins with just a mustard seed. Good morning, church. This is the communion. Today, our reference will be from Matthew chapter 27. And this is where Jesus stood in front of the governor, which is Pilate. And at this moment, it is when Pilate realized and understood that this is an innocent man that's being prepared for crucifixion. Let's start at and pick up at verse 20. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who was called the Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let, this, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. You know, although they did this deed with evil intentions, they didn't realize that they spoke the truth. That was Christ's whole purpose, was that his blood would cover all of them as well as their children. So I thank God that his blood reaches out and it covers me and my sins. So at this moment, let us go to God in prayer and thank God for his blood and for his crucifixion that reaches out to all of us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for your many blessings. We thank you, Father, for your son who died and crucified himself for our sins. We thank you for this bread that represents his broken body. We thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine that represents his shedded blood that covers all of us and covers all of our sins. And that it gives us the opportunity, Father, to have a relationship with you. We thank you, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness torn through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living goal, who could imagine so great a mercy would heart 
I could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross is spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ My living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain This salvation in your name Jesus Christ My living being with us our worship service today. Always good to have you with us, virtually or in person. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Thank you, Almighty Father, again for our time to be together this day. Your ever-presence in each of our lives is so important to us. And we are always thankful, dear Father, for the blessing of your Son, Jesus, our Redeemer. By his presence at your throne, he intercedes for us always. The power of his cleansing blood enables us to be forgiven for things we've done wrong. And please, Father, for words we may have spoken that were unkind or inappropriate, forgive us. For thoughts or intentions that were not pure, please, Father, again, forgive us. And yes, Father, guide and direct us in our calling and place. If we have disappointed, please correct us. If we are showing an attitude or a nature that is not according to your will, as well, Father, guide us, set us on a course that's always according to your will. Your loving kindness and your patience it always helps us, Father, in so many ways. We are grateful. This hour we ask, Father, please to continue with those who among us are ill or have loved ones who are ill. Those who attend to them, doctors, nurses, and staff, please guide them in their decisions and help them, Almighty Father, to come to a conclusion that will enable them to heal, to be strengthened. Your grace, your mercy makes all of this possible. We'd ask as well that you would continue with the travelers among us. Many people are now moving about, Father. Please keep everyone safe. And as the summer months continue and as a time of togetherness and vacations, please, Father, keep everyone safe in all of their travels. We're also mindful, dear Father, of the calling that we have in your son's kingdom, the church. 
some congregations among us are struggling in difficulties, sometimes attitudes and natures and thinkings and understanding become confused. Please, Father, help us to be patient with one another, guide us in all that we do that's according to your will. And thank you, Father, for all the ways you've helped us and strengthened us forever. We love you. Please continue with us in our life walk. It's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. God bless everyone. Thank you so much for sticking around for one more thing. As I mentioned at the very beginning, this is our last, hopefully, last uh, pre-recorded online worship service. In the future, we'll be uh, streaming uh, directly from the church service that takes place at Lawson Road. And so I, I want to just uh, take this moment to thank so many people who have helped us to be able to uh, do this for the last two and a half years. Um, you are aware of many of them. You've seen their faces, uh, doing the readings, sharing the Lord's Supper talks. The elders every week have been uh, opening and closing our, our videos, our, our online services. and. Each of those is a separate video that that person has taken during the week. And um, you sometimes we've had all sorts of fun and games trying to get it delivered over the internet to me. Uh, maybe it's the video's too big to email and different things like that. But uh, for two and a half years, the, these, people, these guys have just done a great job of uh, uh, pulling ever, getting everything delivered and uh, allowing us to um, worship with you in this way and so I would just encourage you uh, take note of who those guys are and when you see them thank them or send them an email or something and just say look because they've done something extra usually they can just turn up at the church building on a Sunday morning and say their prayer or read their scripture there may be no preparation that's specific preparation that's required and for, for this two and a half years we've said hey we want you to stop on Wednesday and um, or, or whatever day of the week it is record this and get it to us so that we can read scripture together on Sunday um, and, and so I just I, I certainly appreciate their time that's made all of this possible and um, and I hope that you do too and that you pass that along um, and, and it's been I hope that you you've seen uh, some growth some improvement some confidence building over the, this time period as well to tie it back into the message of, of today uh, it's been a two and a half years has sort of been a bit of a wilderness for us hasn't it and uh, maybe you feel like you're coming out of it with just a little bit of faith, maybe less than you went in. And, and I think that's, that's okay. I mean, the great thing about a mustard seed, I didn't say this in, in the sermon, is that it grows. And, and so wherever we start, God doesn't want us to finish there. But our faith is something that can and does grow. And uh, there'll be times that it, it, we, we struggle when we go through hardship, but uh, the nature of, of plants is, is growth. And, uh, and that's our relationship with God. Also, God wants his relationship with us to grow and to deepen. I pray that this week, your relationship with God will be one that uh, begins or continues the process of growing and knowing him better and better. Oh, Jesus is the God.